You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Sandra Brown on the show with me today. She has an amazing new book, and I'm holding it in my hands right now, the hardcover of Thick as Thieves. And uh, let me tell you guys, if you love mysteries and thrillers the way I do, this is a must-have. For your summer reading stack and uh this is uh you, you know you need to go ahead and move it to the top as a matter of fact um welcome to the show sandra well thank you hank and thank you for that wonderful endorsement <laughs> you're you're more than welcome um sandra we begin each show with the same question and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller hmm I think it was probably when I read a book by an author, and this is going to really date me, uh, but I read a book by an author named um, Taylor Caldwell. Do you remember? Uh, She uh, was a a writer like in the early 60s, um, and she used a male pseudonym, um, hoping that that would help her to get published. But then she had such an amazing body of work. And one of her books was, is still, it it remains one of my favorites called The Testimony of Two Men. Uh, And it was just a, it was just to me a riveting story. It was kind of a family saga and uh, was two brothers, one woman, um, so the dynamic uh, was perfect for a Sandra Brown book. But when I read that book, I remember reading it over and over several times. And I thought, gosh, I would love to be able to do this, to uh, captivate a reader and and, um, and and make a reader care as much as I cared for her characters and to see how this was all going to unfold and play out. Um, so I think that's the first time I remember thinking, gee, I wish I could do it. Although my love of reading and stories goes back to as far as I can remember. Uh, My parents were both readers. My father was a writer, although he was an editorial writer. And um, but books were such, you know, I mean, such fixtures in my growing up always. And my mother was um, uh, she loved stories. She was the romantic. Uh, she she told my sisters and me stories and read us fairy tales from my early memory. And I just remember, you know, not doing my chores because I, I was had my nose in a book all the time. Uh, so I think it was steeped into me and it was certainly in the gene pool. Um and, and it was actually, I didn't start writing till I was 30. So uh, I did some other things, but I always came back to that, you know, just love of storytelling and wish I could do it. <laughs> well, Sandra, um, you, you published your first book in 1981. Is that right? Correct. Uh huh. And I was 10 years old at the time. Uh, and as someone who spent a lot of time in libraries and bookstores, uh, mm-hmm. especially, your name is one of those names that's just kind of always been around. That's someone that that I bumped into over and over and over again. Um, and you're like 33 now or so, so you've been <laughs> publishing longer than you've been alive, which is which is amazing to me. I wish. <laughs> um, you said you you didn't start publishing until you were 30. Um, was there something else? Um, uh, that you pursued before writing? What what was the thing that brought you over 
Um, well, I think but what I was pursuing at that time, I was, you know, a woman of my generation. Um, I got married early and uh, my husband and I just had our uh, anniversary yesterday. In fact, we've been together a long time, but um, I married early, uh, four and a half years after marriage, had my first child, then two years later had my second. And so I was working always part time. I worked um, as a showroom model at the Dallas Apparel Mart for many years. And then um, at the same time I was doing that, I was doing part time TV work for the ABC affiliate in Dallas. I worked on a show called PM Magazine. So I, I had these part time things going, uh, besides being a, a mother, but, um, I got fired from my job <laughs> <laughs> and it was, as I said, it was part-time. So luckily the family wasn't depending on me for livelihood, but it was my creative outlet. You know, it was, it was my thing and I really enjoyed it. And while I love my role as, as wife and mom, I, I, I was always seeking something else. And so really my husband uh, at the time said, you know, you've got time and opportunity now to do something you've always said you wanted to do, and that was to write. So why don't you give it a shot? You, you can either keep talking about it or you can do it. So really it was more or less on a dare from him um, that I started and it was like, yeah, but I don't know anything about it, you know? And um, so I started attending some, you know, conferences and, um, and reading books on how to write fiction and literally set up a card table, um, and a typewriter, <laughs> that's how far back this goes and, um, got several reams of paper and just started, you know, putting words on paper, which, uh, my advice to aspiring writers is at some point you have to stop studying it. You have to stop talking about it. You just have to sit down and, and do it because I don't believe anybody really knows they can or can't until they, until they try, until they put in years uh, alone in a room and, and figure it out. And so that's, it's really how, how I began. Sandra, I had you... these two kids at home and um, you know, a brother and sister and they would squabble and they would, you know, and I'd have to bribe them to, to leave me alone and let me work. This is, <laughs> they were younger than preschool. And, um, you know, I'd say, unless it's an emergency, leave me alone, you know, for 30 minutes. And, and they'd say, well, what's an emergency? And I'd say smoke <laughs> or blood. <laughs> it doesn't involve one of those two things. Just save it. But uh, so it was like a holiday for me when they both got into school full time. <laughs> I could that's, write all day. That's so funny. Um, Sandra, what um, what I would love to know is when when you first when, when you had this desire to be a writer and then, you know, circumstances kind of lined up that allowed you to do that. Um, was it a particular story that kept nagging at you or was it just the desire to tell stories like um, w was there a a particular book that just had to get out of you no no it wasn't it was uh, just a desire to tell a story and i had in the back of my mind the first the first manuscript i really wrote all the way through i did i tried some short stories which was a huge mistake because I didn't even read short stories, but I thought, well, one good, easy way to get published would be through women's magazines, who at that time, you know, they had fiction sections in each edition. And, uh, but I didn't, I, that was the wrong pursuit for me. Um, so I had this historical idea and I thought, well, I'll just write that. And it was about cowboys and, <clears throat> and so I wrote that, that was the first full length work that I did all the way through. But then <clears throat> I got off on to more uh, contemporary and it was actually a contemporary story that I saw first. 
Interesting. Um, so, you know, a lot of writers don't don't You're immediately. I'm I sorry. Just got a tickle. That's that's quite all right. <laughs> Sorry. That's that's okay. Sandra, a lot of uh, writers uh, kind of struggle, uh, not not necessarily struggle, but their you know their first book or two don't uh, don't meet uh, the wide audience appeal that that they are, are kind of later known for, uh, and and some of that is uh, is the particular story. Some of it is you just haven't built. Um, the audience uh, to expect y- your books when they come out. But what was your uh, your kind of upward trajectory like uh, w- when it came to publishing? And how long did it take for you to find the Sandra Brown audience? Well, I I wrote uh, uh, a story, and this um, local published author was gracious enough to read it. Uh, my husband had a talk show and she had been on his talk show <laughs> promoting her book. And he said, she was really nice. You want to call her and get some, you know, advice from her. And so I did. And she said, well, send me something that you've written. So I sent her a manuscript and she was, as I said, gracious enough and kind enough to read it. And she said, well, you definitely have a voice. You've got a great command of the language but you need to learn how to plot. (laughs) I said, Mm. plot, right. (laughs) So I started studying and I rewrote the story and I I did my homework. I mean, I, I started reading every book I could on, okay, what's this thing called plot? And, um, and I kept writing and writing and I went to a writer's convention and uh, or it was really like a workshop. And there I met uh, a woman who owned a bookstore and she said, I introduced myself and she said, well, I've read everything ever written because she was a school librarian before she owned the bookstore. And she said, when you get a manuscript, you like send it to me, which I did. And she had said, you definitely need to be writing romances. Uh, and I said, like, what's a romance? And because <laughs> to me, a story was a story. And she said, well, like Harlequin, which is at that point in time was the only publisher of romances. So that's kind of the orientation I'd read about. I went to the store and bought about 12 of them and read them back to back and thought, yeah, I can do this. I see what she's talking about. So I sent her, I called her up a few months later and I said, well, I have a manuscript I'd like to send you. I did. She wrote me back. She said, there's a new line starting at Bantam Doubleday Dell called Ecstasy. And she said, I think your manuscript would fit perfectly into that. So she sent it to the editor. The editor called me, bought that first book. And, uh, and then 13 days. She said, do you, have you gotten anything else? And I said, yeah, I've written another one since that one. And she said, is it the same kind of book? I said, yes, send me, send me that one. I did. And then 13 days later, she bought the second one. So I I saw my first two within 13 days of each other. Um, but then I, I wrote 40, something romances um, as, as under four different names um, before I thought I, I want to, but always with the view of moving into a more mainstream, um, you know, category and writing on a larger canvas, uh, so to speak. And um, so I gradually evolved in about the, 1990s, I guess, evolved out of strictly romance and started incorporating more suspense, more thriller aspects, more uh, mystery. And so it it really has been, you know, an evolution. Um, And at the time, it it was leaving that, you know, velvet lined rut because I was doing, you know, very well as a romance writer. So it was kind of, you know, stretching 
uh, and challenging myself to to move out of that and into you know um, a much bigger, much broader genre. Um, but I love what I'm doing now, and I feel as though uh, I didn't really leave anything behind. I only brought what I had learned from doing those romances into what I'm doing now because you had to get into the action so quickly, you know, because they were short series romances. And so they were good teaching tools. They really were. And um, then I still love them. I still enjoy them, you know, so it never left me. Sandra, as we um, uh, alluded to earlier, you you have really been a, a mainstay of publishing for for so long, and um, you really have such a broad appeal uh, with readers. Uh, you know that there are women, there are men, there are um, uh, that they love your books for for this reason or that reason. What do you attribute the the broad appeal um, uh, of your books to to a reading audience? What, what do you think it is that just appeals to everyone well what i if i have a, a a trademark i think one of the one of the sander brown trademarks would be that i always try to to build in a kind of a jaw dropper at the end um and and that that's really hard to do, uh, <laughs> but I think that that uh, my reading audience and and I appreciate them whether they started with me you know all those years ago reading my romances or if they're newly you know acquainted with Sandra Brown and and I get uh, you know fan responses like, where have you been all my life? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad I've got 70 something books to read, you know, so it's nice when you have made a recent convert. Uh, but in terms of the broad appeal, I think that st storytelling is storytelling. People uh, and I had an editor, my first editor, in fact, she said, stop worrying about promotion and whether you should be sending out bookmarks and, you know, taking donuts to the truck drivers and stuff like that. She <laughs> said, sit down and write a good book because a good book will be read and it will be found. And I've, I've always taken that advice to heart is that control what I can control. And what I can control is the quality of the of the storytelling. Right. So I. I try to dwell on uh, are my characters people that um, you find fascinating, you know, and I I go completely against the grain of writing what you know, because what I know is not that exciting. <laughs> I mean, you know, I could write a book about my next door neighbor, but unless they find, you know, parts of his wife in the freezer, um, he's not all that <laughs> electrifying. Right. So I I don't I never wanted to write what I know. I wanted to write what I wanted what I wish I knew. Right. Um and uh so I like to take my my reader and and my goal all along, Hank, has always been only to entertain. Um and if I can you know, keep my reader entertained if I've provided them with characters that they care about, even if it's the villain, you know, uh, this, the villain has to be captivating. Um, and certainly the protagonist has to be someone that the reader wishes they knew, you know, gosh, I wish I knew that guy. I wish I knew that woman, um, because they've lived, they're doing something exciting. Um, so good storytelling, um, it can be historical, it can be science fiction, it can be a mystery, but you, you, I try and captivate my reader, um, uh, with a storyline and with characters that they can't wait to find out what happens next and then leave them with a, oh my gosh, I didn't see that coming. Um, right. so that's kind of the way I, I approach it. Sandra, a lot of new writers will um, become overly attached to a particular story, um, especially one that they've published, and and they have a uh, th this story means something very 
deeply uh, to them. Um, they they feel a connection with it, and it's hard for them to move on uh, because they're so invested in this thing, and and rightfully so. You know, a, a book is a large chunk of your life that goes into it. Um, but as someone that has had what 70, 71 uh, New York Times bestsellers, um, how do you look back on the breadth of your writing career and uh, and do all of these? Do all of these books mean something to you? Um, how do you move on from one project to another? Well, that's that's a multi-layered question. I know it's like twenty when I, questions. When I look <laughs> back, as you called it, at the breadth of of the body of work, I'm absolutely amazed. Yeah. Uh, I, I look, and I I have to. Uh, because it's very paranoid and uh, distrustful of the success, <laughs> I never feel like, you know, I've quite made it. And if only I could be better. Um, and when I start every book, I get this, you know, this panic that, well, I'll never be able to come up with anything again. And I look at the wall of bookshelves, you know, in my office, and I'm going, how did I do that? <laughs> I, I, it, it's, and so it, it is kind of a bafflement to me, the endurance, the longevity. And I guess that's one thing that, that I'm the most grateful for is that I've been so fortunate um, to be able to do something that I love to do and, and make a, a career of it. I, I know how enviable a position that is to be in, and um, I'm so grateful for that. Um, but in terms of, of letting go of some books there are some that uh that i did become very attached to very attached to the characters that really um you know stand out in my memory and in my mind and then there are other books that i look at and i go gosh i don't remember i don't even remember writing that and i i promise you i can take one off the shelf sometime just to reassure myself that I really did this and I really do know how <laughs> to some extent. I really do know how to do it, but I'll open one up and I'll start reading and I swear to you, I have no idea what's going to come next. It's it. I think I've, most writers write in a, you know, it's a stream of consciousness and I can go back the day after I've written 10 pages and start rereading it and going, I don't even remember writing that sentence. It's a pretty darn good sentence. I really like that. <laughs> and sometimes I can open an older book just somewhere and I'll laugh at something a character says, um, like it, it, it's the first time I've ever seen it. Um, a lot of what you're talking about in terms of, of attachment and um, the meaningfulness of a, of a particular book um, has to do sometimes with what's going on in my personal life. You know, I've seen, um, like everyone's life, it, you know, I've had ups and downs. I've had losses um, that, that were so hurtful and so painful. And yet, um, you know, I was under contract. I had to do my work. Um, and the books, in a way, are, are my escape, too, sometimes, you know, from what was going on in my life. And um, so I, it, they, in a way, ground me. <laughs> know when everything else is falling apart, um, you know, I can come in here and write for a few hours, and it's like I get my footing again, you know, um, and, and carry on. Um, so some books I look upon very fondly and then other books I look upon with a little bit of, <sighs> you know, because it wasn't, I wasn't having a good time when I wrote that one. And some are just more fun than others. You know, some are just more fun to write than others. Sandra, I've heard you describe your writing process um, uh, previously, and it, it sounds to me like um, if you had to put yourself in a camp, you would you would be over in the pantser camp, uh, the, the kind of folks that write by the seat of their pants. 
Um, <laughs> um, I, that terrifies some people, and I think the the thought terrifies of, me, <laughs> well, I, as it should a little bit, I guess. But uh, you know, some people are are just terrified of the unknown, and well, what happens when you sit down at the computer and you don't know what's going to happen next? How do I deal with that? Um, has it ever been an issue for you, or oh, is gosh. this kind of? I, I've heard you talk about the the sense of wonder, like uh, I, I think I heard you say one time that that about halfway through the book, you're just excited to see where the story is going to go. Um, has that excitement n- ever not shown up or? Oh, gosh, uh, have- yes. I mean, and in fact, the the times that uh, that happens where something happens that shocks the hell out of me, I mean, it'd be like, Oh gosh, I didn't see that coming. And that's so fun, but it's few and far between. There are nights when, you know, I come home from work and, and I'll just sit in, you know, and there with my head in my hands and going, I, I, I can't finish this book. I have no idea where it goes from here. And my husband blesses heart has to sit there and listen to this you know um it's <laughs> agonizing for both of us and and it can last for you know maybe uh, maybe a couple of days but then sometimes a couple of weeks and i'll just i'll keep going back and back and back and rewriting the the earlier stuff you know the stuff that i've already done just so uh, i'm putting in a productive day and eventually something will occur to me and I'll go, Oh, I could, I could take it there. And then I always feel as though, uh, the story is there and it's not so much for me to make it up, to devise it as it is to excavate it, that it is, that it is there. It's in a parallel universe and it's up to me to, to bring it out. Um, so I often, you go, go to sleep at night and, and wondering what are my characters doing while I'm not there? (laughs) What are they up to, you know? Um, so I know all this sounds a little schizophrenic and, and I guess it really is. Um, but when I, when I sit down and open up a book, for instance, uh, let's talk about Thickest Thieves, since that's the one that's on sale. And, Absolutely. Um, and consequently, it's the one I poured my life's blood into. <laughs> but um, uh, Thickest Thieves, I it was one of those, um, what I consider just a blessing, a gift. Um, one of those times I wasn't doing anything else, and I heard someone say, the surefire way, talking about it is a surefire way to get caught. And I thought, I just stopped and just froze. And I thought, who said that? And where, where is this person? And I start looking around and I'm in the middle of the, of the prologue of the book. I'm in that ditch with these four people and they've just, they got a bag of money that they've just stolen. And I, I just started writing down what I, what they said and what I saw and what I smelled and what I could see, and what I sensed. And by the time, you know, I had six pages and the last four sentences or last five sentences was by daybreak, that plan was shot to hell. One was in the hospital, one was in jail, one was in the morgue, and one got away with it. And I thought, but which is which? And who who, who <laughs> were they? And so I, when a scene like that starts asking me questions, you know, when I want to know, then I have to think that I would leave the reader asking those same questions. I had no idea what came next and and i then i i thought but what if it's not the next day what if it's like 20 years have gone by somebody got away with the money who was it um and what happened to the other three 
And so that's when I came up with the idea of Arden, and that's when I came up with the idea of Ledge um, and how he would have been kind of a hard-bitten, you know, soldier, veteran of war. And, um, and then the guy, you know, who started it all was Rusty. And, and I think, what would be the worst that could happen <laughs> well, <laughs> if Rusty had, you know, he was a thief, but he turned out to be, you know, an officer of the court. So it was, um, and so then the story started, you know, unfolding. Um, I don't fly completely completely by the seat of my pants because um, I do kind of follow a, a plan of, of storytelling, which is, you know, you have to have the reluctance on the part of the protagonist and then what what gets them all in. There's a, a point at about page 100, 125. I've gotten everybody in place. Now, here's the terrible trouble what gets the protagonist all in they've got to make a commitment to solve this problem so then another 100 pages or so you have to have a flip a, a reversal something is revealed that up to that point was not known and then there's another point where you know so i build in like these tent poles of, of something that kind of reverses the story or that twists it around or that, you know, uh, introduces an unknown fact that changes everything. Uh, and then I know what the main jaw dropper is going to be at the end. I know what, I know the one thing that I know that the reader doesn't know. And when I get that, I know that my idea has become a story. That's the reason to tell the story. Because you can have an idea and work on it forever, and it, it just finally says, I don't want to be a story. And that's happened a lot of times. Um, but I know that an idea becomes a story when I get that one thing that I know that the reader doesn't know. And when I get that... That's my aha moment. And and then I can kind of, you know, fill it in. So I know where I'm going. I just don't know right. how I'm going to get there. And that's kind of the fun part. But it's also the terrifying part. You know, it's the it's the downhill on the roller coaster. It's like, OK, you've started this. <laughs> you've got to finish the ride. And, and that's so much fun. Um, the. In Thick as Thieves, this book, uh, the setting of this book, is uh, is a fantastic setting, um, and it really should be uh, another character in the it book. It is uh, another character. Definitely. It is th yeah. this this interesting place where East Texas butts up against uh, Louisiana or Louisiana, as we call it here, in Mississippi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, is this magical kind of place that's neither Texas, neither uh, Louisiana, and uh, otherworldly uh, almost? Could you tell us a little bit about this setting and, is, and why uh, you chose it? it? Well, it does. It I've used it uh, a couple of times before because it is one of those places that is just shrouded in not only Spanish moss, but it's shrouded in mystery and folklore and um and and it's um it is otherworldly the state line between texas and louisiana cuts right through the lake so the two states share it uh, a larger portion of it is in texas than is in louisiana but it looks a whole lot more like louisiana than people envision of texas you know Right. People see us as, you know, long hair, long horned cattle and tumbleweeds. And there's a whole <laughs> lot more to Texas than that. But um, this is uh, it's it's swampy. It's bayous um, that intersect in this incredible labyrinth. And um, it's it's formed by the Sabine River. Um, and the um, years ago, it got log jam, literally, and that formed the lake. I mean, this goes back, you know, centuries. But um, and and it's uh, reputed to have a um, set squash. 
it has black panthers in the forest around it that have actually been photographed. They're very elusive. It's got alligators, water moccasins. I mean, it's it, it, but it's also uh, an incredible uh, aviary um, and uh, just all kinds of wildlife and, and bird life um, inhabit it. So for that reason, it's fascinating. And um that you one could get uh, easily lost in it because it all kind of looks alike and it's the cypress trees that grow up out of it you know just they they look haunting and um and so it's um it, it does lend itself to this story and when i conceived of of what the story was going to be i thought well the perfect place you know is Caddo lake and the and the area around it um and it's very backwoodsy and you know in every book i try to create a, a little a world that's kind of apart from the rest of the world if you go back and you look at at my books they're always kind of there aren't a lot of other people moving around in the world. You know, it's it's um, it's usually two or three people kind of in this sphere of their own. It's kind of a microcosm. And I do that. I do that on purpose. Uh, one of the best teachers of that is Dean Koontz. Um, I was a big fan of his when I first started writing and I got to meet him one time and I acted like a blithering idiot because <laughs> I could barely speak, you know, as hero worship. But he was always so good about creating, putting his characters in a situation where it seemed like they were the only people on earth, that there was no one else, you know, around. There was no one else to help there. And so I, I, took that lesson from him is that kind of create uh, this little sphere where your people are, are operating, but they're kind of set off, you know, from the rest of the world. And, um, and I like that, that sense of enclosure, you know, you could take it literally and put somebody, you know, in, in a space module in outer space. And it's the same kind of thing, you know, an alien, <laughs> They were up there all by themselves. They had to solve the problem, you know. So it's a it's a storytelling um, technique, uh, but sometimes y you want to make your character just seem like they are to totally alienated from everybody else. They're 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 their only salvation. Sandra, um, we we talked a little earlier about the evolution of your of your writing career and and how writing those early um, romance books really helped you with writing uh, mysteries and thrillers and the the you know kind of ramping up the the story and the plot quickly. Um, over your forty nearly forty year writing career, how have the tools available to writers? Uh, impacted your uh, your writing style or um, the way that you write, uh, or, or do you uh, you know are, are you still the same style of writer that you began with? Um, you know, with the advent of computers and laptops and things like that over typewriters or you know whatever you started with, um, have have those tools changed the writing process? The, the the main one for me, I mean, the uh, the Gutenberg printing press for me was uh, <laughs> was the uh, computer. I had um, an IBM display writer. I went from an IBM um, Selectric, I think it was called. It was a, a electric typewriter with the ball uh, with the ball. Yeah. Uh, and my husband, but I would still have to, to, uh, you know, do like four drafts of every book. So, <clears throat> um, when I was typing that last one, I get to the bottom of the page and proof it and see that I'd made, you know, two typos. So being, uh, kind of, a uh, <laughs> perfect perfectionist, um, I would type, retype the whole thing. 
And so finally, you know, my husband said, they're, they're not paying you to type. <laughs> they're paying you to write. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So you need to look into getting a computer. Well, to me, a computer was, I, he just as soon said, you know, get a, a tank, a Sherman <laughs> tank. We'll put it in the backyard. Because I, I said, well, I, I have trouble with my hair dryer. There's no way I would ever learn to work a computer, <laughs> you know. And so we borrowed the money. This is a true story. We borrowed the money uh, to buy me my first IBM uh, display writer. And of course, once I got in, it was just like, well, this is, you know, this is amazing uh, because everything could be done, you know, so much more efficiently. So I was right. able to, um, you know, my productivity like quadrupled that year. Um, and, but in terms of, uh, I guess the only other thing I can, in, in terms of just writing, uh, the technology hasn't really helped me in any way, except, um, being able to go directly to dictionary or thesaurus or the internet to look up something you know, really quickly, um, typing in, you know, what do you call that thing that, <laughs> you know, and I know what I'm trying to think of, but I can't think of the word. And so, and it's things like that, that now take 30 seconds, which as before, you know, it would have taken several minutes. So, uh, it, it's that, but I have to say, I, I don't work on a laptop. I find it real hard not to be writing in my little spaces. And I have several spaces. I have a small office at home. I have an office that my two employees work in with me um, that I go to most days. And then I go away several times a year to my little cabin in the woods kind of thing. And, and that's all I do is write. I shut down my life. No appointments, no social life, no nothing. I mean, it's pajamas all day, um, and that's all I do is write. And that's typically toward the end of the, um, the final draft when it's really crunch time, and I, I've got to get it as good as I can get it and get it in on time. Um, and that comes right after the holiday season. I usually leave on January 5th and don't come back until like March 1st. Um, just so that last seven or eight weeks is just really, that's all I'm focused on. Um, but I don't take a laptop with me when I travel because I can't really set up in a hotel room and write. It just, you know, it just doesn't work for me. Um, and so I like my spaces. I like my creature comforts. You know, I've got my candles, my orchid plant. <laughs> uh, but um, the what the what the internet and the technology represents to me is a lot of extra work. If you want to know <laughs> truthfully, it it um, can be that's for sure. It's a great tool uh, for publicity and doing interviews like this. Um, that we used to would have had to do on the, over the phone. And, and um, so I, I love that aspect of it, that I can reach so many more people uh, than doing even whistle stop, you know, book tours. And I still love that pressing the flesh and getting out and meeting my readers one on one and looking them in the eye and it's important for them to see me as you know, I'm just a regular person. Uh, but also for me to hear their comments and um, whether they're positive or negative, they're healthy, they're good for me. Um, so I appreciate that technology has enabled me to reach people um, in, a, in a better, more blanket kind of way. But on the other hand, it's a great blue whale. Um, that it's a, a great blue whale that is so voracious and the more you feed it, the more it wants. Right. And so it's, it's, um, 
you know, it gets to be very time consuming. And at some point along the way, I have to go back to that first editor who said, write a good book. Um, I have to just shut it down and say, my job isn't doing this. My job is writing a book and writing it to the best of my ability. So I don't ever want to get the wrong priority here, you know, or no matter how much publicity you do, if you write a lousy book, you're publicizing a lousy book (laughs) and people will find it. (laughs) And, And I think that's sound advice. Um, when people are hearing this interview, uh, Sandra, today will be release day for the book, and uh, Thick as Thieves is, uh, will be out everywhere uh, in their favorite bookstore or in the in the Kindle store if they like to read it that way, uh, but also at Audible. And uh, when uh, I, I can't wait because I can get the, the audio book from Audible, and e- even though I've uh, read the hardback uh, you know, as I was prepping for the show, um, I'm I'm super excited to listen to the audio book, yeah. and that that has been a huge growth market for for books over the last few years. I mean, we know audio books have been around for a while, but they have just really taken but off. And they have, yes. And, and for someone like me who does five shows a week, um, audio books are just essential for for me being prepared um, to talk to people, um, like you, uh, and, and I just love them. There, there's something about the place in my life where I am, where, you know, when I'm driving kids around or think I can be listening to a book and, and, and I just love it. Um, how do you feel about your books being translated to audio and, and about this, this, I, I'm saying new with air quotes with my fingers here, uh, this new segment of publishing, even though it's not necessarily new but it's being embraced by more people now i think so and i love it um i i think and i don't i don't do a long commute um but i know so many people who do and so many people who take you know uh the books on trips with them and um and go to the beach with it and and it is another format. And my uh, mantra has always been that I don't care how people read the book or in what format they get the book. If listening to it is their thing, I'd, I want them to be, you know, quote, reading it that way. Right. Um, I have I've had such good fortune in my readers. Um, I use. Um, Victor Slazak for many years, and uh, sadly, he he has been ill for the past year, and so he could not do Thick as Thieves, but um, they suggested another reader to me, and I did not know him. Um, His name is Keith Brewer, and it's K-Y-F, but it's pronounced like Keith, and um, and so I was, I was, and Victor and I had, um, you know, we had worked together for many years. I'd also worked with Stephen Lang. And uh, so they knew Sandra Brown books, you know, they, sure. they knew what, what they were going to be reading. And it's really difficult uh, for most people to do um, a Southern accent without making it sound like a caricature right and so that was what i was worried about so when the hachette audio people suggested keep i said well send me some of his uh samples along with and and so they actually had had two or three readers read the first chapter or the prologue or something but the minute i heard his voice I, i thought you know he's he's the one and um, so I asked the the man at Hachette, I said, would it be possible because he doesn't know me or, you know, any, he hasn't received the book yet for us to have a chat? Would he be open to that? And he said, well, I'm sure he would, would you? Because the actors, the narrators are always saying, you know, I wish I, I could talk to the author about, you know, and I said, oh, sure. I'm more than willing so we set up a, a phone date and we wound up talking about 45 minutes um, and he's really great. He has a great voice. And I, t- I just took the characters one by one and kind of gave him 
you know, my image of them and where they were coming from. And this is before he'd ever even read the book. And so after he had, and, and before he recorded it, he texted me back and um, several times asking me questions that I thought were very insightful. And um, and then he he did the recording and I think it's great. I think my fans are really going to like him because um, they they really like my other readers. So, um, you know, but but I think he's going to be great. I think he's going to be fantastic because he kind of got it. And he said, I know exactly what you're talking about, you know, uh, and a southern accent. There are so many variations, you know, so. Um, this had to be different from like a Georgia or North Carolina, you know, um, but I think he got it. I think he nailed it. I love it. Well, the new book, Thick as Thieves, is out everywhere now. When you're hearing this, you can go grab it in hardback or Kindle edition or audiobook. Uh, I can't wait, Sandra, to go grab the audiobook uh, when we're finished here and and uh, to plug that in and, and oh, give good. that a listen. Um Sandra, if if people are just learning about you, God forbid, um, where is uh, where can they find you online to dig into all of the great stuff that you do? Um, it's sandrabrown.net is my website, and I am on Twitter. It's Sandra Brown underscore NYT. And let's see what else. <laughs> my Facebook page is. Um, Sandra Brown author and I'm very excited we have a new group um, on that Facebook page uh, and it's for fans anyone can join but it is a private group and it's called the ambassador uh, group and uh, these are die-hard Sandra Brown fans that are able to communicate with each other and we just launched it um, couple of weeks ago so this is this is it's really catching on and so i'm pleased to announce that so with just a little bit of, of um navigation people can find me <laughs> so much fun um sandra i'll uh i'll uh gather up all those links and put them in the show notes to make it easy for people to find um, this has been so much fun chatting. Uh, the Thank new you. book. And now the, the this podcast, this is fantastic. I, I love this format. It's just it's so relaxed. It's so fun. Well, thank uh, you. And uh, thank you for having me, Hank. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. We're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of Thick as Thieves. Um, Sandra, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Quite welcome. My pleasure. <laughs>